All right. Hey everybody. Hi. Nice to Let's see go. you all. Jill, it's nice to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I remember talking to you at QuickBooks Connect years ago. I know. Just once in a while. Hopefully you guys don't hear the noise in my background. <laughs> I have my gardeners here blowing leaves and things. I don't hear anything. All right, yeah. good. Yeah, That's I think bad. your mic cancels out a lot of your background noise. Yeah, me. it's I, for what I paid it better, but I've never known for sure. I hear it, and so it's annoying yeah. to me. No. Don't my gardeners understand I'm doing background. webinars right now? <laughs> What'd you say, Greg? Uh, I was just wondering if it should cancel out the background noise and do his gardening. <laughs> Here we go. That would be awesome. All right. Let's see. I guess uh, we'll give it another minute or two in case other people want to join us. Meanwhile, hopefully everybody's in the Slack workspace who's in Bulletproof Bookkeeping at this point. If you've joined and you haven't joined Slack yet, make sure you join Slack. If you haven't joined, then join, and then you can join Slack. I saw Greg in there talking to Tracy. I, I, see, I get all the notifications. Yeah, I'm looking at that right now, actually. I'm sorry, go ahead. Out with uh, QuickBooks payroll bugaboo. It was going into the wrong account, so we're going to get it resolved for her. All right. I, you know, I haven't looked that closely, Greg, and I'm sure you've thought of this, but from what I did glean, it sounds like she may be running into that issue that comes up sometimes where QBO payroll creates a new bank account and they have yep. to be merged and then you have to change in the settings to make sure it's the exact right name to yep. stop it from continuing. Okay, that, that's, so that's, that's what we had just found out and, yeah. and then we, she lost her connection. So we're going to a while after. All right. All right. I'm Frank, you've seen it do that before? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I've seen it do that a lot, actually. And I don't know why you would think once, because if there's a slight variation in the name of the bank account in the payroll setup, it will just create a new account with that name. What, what often happens, actually, the way it works is that it's set up to go to the one account. And then we, in our infinite wisdom, think, oh, that's not checking. That's chase checking. So we change it to say chase checking. And now all of a sudden, QuickBooks um, payroll is still going to go and put it into checking. And, and that's what happened in, in Tracy's case. So that's, that's what we're trying to resolve. Now, unfortunately, what, what might happen is now you've got payroll, exactly. posting, payroll posting to the one account. And yeah. then people meaning well in the Chase checking account in the bank feed meaning well posting to who knows what and we were just about to embark on figuring out if that were the case or, or not oh you mean so there may be duplicates because somebody manually posted paychecks that were actually already posted precisely because yeah. one thing i have tested is that you can merge the accounts and it doesn't upset anything but long, if you have duplicates you'll still have duplicates yeah, exactly Cool. All right. Well, I have got the QBO test drive company up, so I'm going to get this party started. Greg and Courtney, I've made you co-host, so please keep an eye on that attendee queue. Let people in, because once I get rolling, I will not notice if somebody's trying to get in. Um, all right. So this, by the way, was planned to be a lesson that I was going to add into the course, and I hadn't gotten around to it yet, but so many people have been asking for it. I said, let me just do it as a webinar. And then what I'll do is I'll either uh, 
I'll either actually stick this in the actual lessons in the course, or I'll just record a private one anyway, just because I can. <laughs> so, um, but I want to show this because a lot of people struggle with it. And I think once you see my process for how I do it, I think you're going to see that it's actually very, very easy to manage this. So we're talking about customer deposits or retainers, right? This comes up a lot with law firms where there's trust accounts, um, but it comes up in a lot of other ways as well. You know, first time it came up for me was when I started doing a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, training with people where they would prepay for a support plan and that included so many sessions. And so I was getting money up front that wasn't really mine yet because I hadn't earned it. And if they canceled, theoretically, I'd have to refund it. So that money had to go on my balance sheet as a liability, right? And a lot of clients, what they'll do is they'll just receive a payment from a customer where there's no invoice. And then we see negative receivables in the aging. And we say, what's this? Where's the invoice for this, right? And so in some cases, that might be sufficient. But as we all know, as accountants and bookkeepers, it's just ugly on the balance sheet, right? We have negative AR and we don't like that. We don't want to see that. So we want a nice clean way to, to record it, but also we need a good workflow for how to manage it, right? So that at any given time, we can easily go in and see how much of whose money do we have that hasn't been earned yet? Or maybe we have to kind of run that report and look at it and see what amount, you know, or, or so, so that we can record the amounts that we've earned when we've earned them and see what amount do we have on deposit from them so we can apply that as we're invoicing them for the actual service. So. That is the quick bit of background on what we're about to go over today. And just because I've gotten really bad about getting carried away and going on too long, I'm setting a timer to make sure I don't go in, into two hours in the webinar. I don't think I've ever quite gone to two hours, but I have done hour and a half webinars that were supposed to be an hour and I don't wanna hold people hostage. So let's take and forget about the fact that this is a design and landscaping service. This is just the QBO test drive. So it's a perfect playground to play in, right? Let's run a balance sheet. I always like to start with a balance sheet and then we'll duplicate this. And then we'll go back and run the P and L. We're not actually gonna do much on the PL. Most of what we're looking at today is happening on the balance sheet, right? Because we get money and it goes into a liability. Then the quick thing that happens on the PL is we invoice and earn the income. And then we take the money out of the liability and apply it to the accounts receivable, right? So most of the action that we're gonna talk about is happening on the balance sheet. Let's get another tab going here. I'm gonna actually bring that back to the front. And we're gonna go into our customers area. So I'm gonna create a new customer just so we can see something that's just nice and clean. I'm very original with my names here. We're gonna call it prepaid customer. Okay, and so the first thing that happens is we talk to the customer and they say, all right, great, let's get started. And we need to invoice them to collect the retainer or deposit, right? So I'll create an invoice. And where this has come up for me a lot is some companies, especially if they're a little bigger company, they need an invoice. Like I can't just say, hey, just send me a payment. You know, they have a process on their end where they need an invoice. They need a document to pay from, so, right? So, so even though it might seem like silly or overkill, it often isn't, okay? So we're gonna create a new product or service called Customer Deposit. I'm gonna add that and we'll set it up as a service type. And the income account, instead of being services, there's gonna be a liability called customer deposits. Okay, current, I assume we're normally going to expect that we're earning this money out within a year's time. Okay, and we'll just, for the detail type, do the same thing. And that's good. So now we've created the item that we can use to track customer deposits. So let's say that we wanna capture a $2,500 deposit from a customer. And of course it's non-taxable. There's nothing being invoiced for services. So this would never be taxable. All right, 
let's uh, save and close. Of course, normally we'd send back to send that over to the customer. And now let's get paid real quick, just so we have the whole kind of cycle in here, right? So we'll go to payment. And let me do one thing actually, just because sometimes in the reports we want to kind of show a timeline. So let's say this is back in June. And let's, we'll say we got the payment later that week. Okay, this invoice, and we don't need to go to undeposited funds with this. We'll just put it straight into the checking account, right? Save and close. Now let's check in on the balance sheet. Let me just click run report to make sure it's refreshed. And here's my customer deposits and here's my $2,500. Now the trick to the workflow and the tracking is gonna to be to create a custom report here. So I'm gonna drill into this. And now we only have the one customer, but because I know at some point I'm gonna have maybe 30 customers with money on deposit, I'm going to create this report based on drilling into the customer deposits account from the balance sheet like I just did. And we're gonna group this by customer. In this case, you don't notice much of a difference. But obviously what this means, it'll group it by customer. We'll see exactly how much money we've collected from prepaid customer and how much of that, if any, we've earned, right? And then the other thing I like to do in this report, especially on something like this, is show the debit and credit columns because it just makes it a lot clearer to see money that we've collected on deposit versus money that we've earned. And you don't need the amount column in there when you're doing this, but I don't mind leaving it in. It doesn't cost me anything extra, right? So now we can see very clearly, we're looking at a liability account. So remember credits are increases to this. So when we earn it, we'll see it come out as a debit. We'll often wanna save this really for all dates. There's a way that you can tweak things that um, I can talk about later if we have time. Uh, where you can actually run it for the current period, but have it exclude, you know, older activity. Because over time, if you run it for all dates, this report's going to get very, very big and long. So there's a way to fix that. So let me save the customization, and we'll call this customer deposits. And we'll spell it correctly. And I'll create a new group for now called Seth's Customer Deposits. Add that and save it. Okay, so now we'll see how this starts to take shape because now it's July 1st and we're ready to invoice them for the actual services, right? So let's create another invoice. And by the way, so that's part one, right? You've just seen the whole process for how to set up the item we need, link it to the liability account and how to create the customer report that we're gonna use to track all of the customer deposits. So now let's create another invoice for the services. Okay, so I think we have like landscape design or something like that. There, design services, okay. Now let's say we're going to earn a thousand of it. Right, just to kind of show you what it looks like when it's a partial. All right, so we're getting a thousand dollars from them that we've earned on July 1st. No taxes, nothing like that. Save and close. So now the first, for the first time we're doing something on the PL, right where design income was just increased by this thousand dollars. You can see it in here in the details to prepaid customer, right? That's all that's happened on the PL so far. Back to here, we still have our prepaid customer deposits right, for 2,500. So now we want to apply, we want to take $1,000 out of here and apply it to that invoice, right? So here's the way I do that. Let's go back here. Here's the July one invoice is the one for the actual services, go away. And let's say there's a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? And you want to be able to see before applying the deposit, how much we've actually billed them for in services. So let's actually add something to this, at least one other line item, right? Um, and let's say we'll just do some installation, okay? And we'll do 500 for that. Now what you can do here, and I'll just add lines, is, and this wasn't here always, I don't know how long ago they actually added this, but we can now add a subtotal. 
right? And this makes a big difference to me in terms of the fact that now we can use that same customer deposit item on the invoice to reduce the AR that I didn't used to like doing it when you couldn't get a subtotal because putting it in there as a line item without a subtotal kind of skewed what the total was. When I send that to the client, it's, it wasn't wrong, of course, but I just didn't like the presentation of it. I always felt like it was important for the client to be able to see I'm being charged $1,500 here, you know, and, and to have that show up at least somewhere on the invoice. Cause now what I want to do to use up the customer deposit is I want to use the same customer deposit item for whatever it takes to zero this out since we've got more than enough to cover it, right? Again, this is not taxable. I probably should have made sure that was not marked as a taxable item when I created it. But now the negative 1500, of course, zeroes this out. And the main thing we want to look at is what's going to happen here in a minute when I hit save and close. So now when I hit save and close, I'll come over here, I'll refresh and boom. So now it's very clear from what I've got here that we got a deposit of 2,500 back on June 1st. We used up 1,500 of it on July 1st, leaving a balance for this customer of $1,000. Okay, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll repeat the process for a different customer so you can start to see how that report takes shape as we add more customers. So let's go back to our customers list and we'll create another new customer. Where did Greg go? He left his chair. I didn't give him permission. I didn't give him a hallway pass. Courtney, make sure he reports back to me when he comes back into the classroom. He's still here. It looks like he's still here. I see an empty chair. Oh, wait, I don't see, wait, where is he? Oh yeah, oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> he wasn't able to see him. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna create a customer called Courtney Services. Save. Okay, and now Courtney, I'm gonna invoice you. Okay, we're gonna get a customer deposit from you. Let's see, how much money do we need from you? Let's say we just need $1,000. We're gonna be kind to you instead of 2,500. I th thought I heard somebody faintly talking in the background. I don't know if that was a question for me. I said, thank you, that could have been me. Oh, okay. All right, so now again, we've invoiced you to collect the deposit for $1,000. One thing that's important to consider here is that when we do this, because we're using an invoice and before that invoice is paid, we've got kind of a bogus liability on the books. It's offset by the related receivable, but just bear in mind that we don't actually owe anybody that money because we haven't been paid that money yet, right? Just in case there's kind of a lag between when we've invoiced it and when we've actually collected it. That's one complaint people have had about this, but there's really no other way around it. You need a way to memorialize that you're getting the deposit, right? So the moral of that story is make sure you get paid quickly because <laughs> it's sort of like a hole in the balance sheet if you don't. All right, let's get a payment from Courtney. All right, I backdated that invoice to like June 17th. So let's say Courtney does pay us really fast. Okay, and we'll put that straight in the checking, save and close. Okay, now we're gonna invoice Courtney for the actual services. Okay, we'll just use up the whole thousand. Okay, so if it's just a thousand, there's really no need for a subtotal, but you can certainly do it just so it's crystal clear. And then we'll use the customer deposit. Minus a thousand, everything zeroes out. Make sure that's not marked taxable. Save and close. And now let's go look at our report here, run it. And so now you can start to see how this comes together. Let me just uh, tweak this a little bit. I don't really need the number. I don't really care about the description right now because there are no descriptions on here. Great. This way we can see everything all at once. So now you can see how nice this lays out, right? When you have it for two or more customers, it's grouped by customer. That's what we did in the beginning when we created this. So the moral of the story is, and this is where you have to kind of build out the workflow, 
either for yourself or with your client, if your client's the one really managing this, is that every time I go to invoice a customer for services, the first thing I need to do is drill into this report and see what, if any, amount we have on deposit from that customer so that before we send them an invoice with a balance, we apply any deposits we've received, right? And so that's the basic workflow. And that's why, of course, I memorized the report. So I don't have to keep recreating it. So if I go back to reports and I go to custom reports, it does this a lot. Even though I created this in the new group, it didn't do it. So I'm going to edit it and put it in the group. All right. So now that works. And if I click here on customer deposits, again, I'm right in there. And it gives me exactly what I need to see. And again, as this list grows, if I'm focusing on one particular customer, I can certainly customize this and put in a filter for one particular customer, right? So I can say, I just want to look at Courtney's services, run that, and boom. So now I'm only looking at Courtney's services, right? So that was one of the workarounds I was sort of referring to in terms of being able to um, chisel this down. So if I need to run it for all dates, because I might have a lot of history, there may be long term projects that span, you know, over a year and so on. So this report can get quite long, but I may need to look at that much history on it. So as I, uh, as I see this list grow, and as it becomes sort of more cumbersome to manage, this is one way you can just chisel it down to one customer, then run it for all dates. So you're looking at just that customer's entire history. The other thing you can do, and I haven't actually tested this in QBO, but this is what we used to do in QuickBooks Desktop with this process, is you can reconcile this account, right? So I would go in here at this point and just reconcile Courtney's activity to zero, right? Because it zeroes out. And then you can filter this report based on the cleared status of uncleared. And what that will do is that this, that's a way to filter out all the old activity, right? So that as this report gets really long, by reconciling it to clear off all the stuff that zeroes out because you collected the deposit and then earned it all, that chisels this report down to only the sort of unused deposits and whatever partially used deposits might still be out there. So that's a way to quickly and easily chisel this list down to just what you need to focus on, right? So for example, now if I went in and said, all right, let's reconcile, go away, go away. Customer deposits, ending balance is zero, 07, 31, 20, start. Okay, so I wouldn't reconcile the 2,500 for a prepaid customer because that's not all used up yet. I really wish I would stop this. But I would reconcile Courtney's activity here because that's all done now. Choose finish now, done. All right, now let's go back to my memorized report. <coughs> okay, and now if I customize and filter, for cleared and say only show me uncleared, boom, Courtney's stuff goes away and all I'm left here with is prepaid customer, right? So that's kind of a slick trick for um, keeping this because th again, the problem is, um, is, is that over time this report's gonna get very big. So that's how you kind of keep it down to something that's sort of manageable, right? Is you keep all the cleared up reconciled activity out of the way by actually reconciling it and then filtering the report for only those things that are still uncleared, right? And that way you can still see what unused deposits exist on the books. And so this is kind of your management tool. This report is your management tool for when you do your invoicing to make sure that you apply any deposits that you've received that haven't been used up. That is the whole entire process and cycle. I mean, that's all of it. And that's what I mean. I think a lot of people get hung up on it. But once you see that, hopefully it becomes very crystal clear how easy it actually is to manage. Can we look at one of the customers in the customer list? I'm curious as to what it shows their balance sure. due. I'm thinking it's going to look like, you know, like when you look at the vendor list, but I'm not. Absolutely. So let's look at uh, prepaid. Right, because that one still has a balance. Right. So 
Will it show you? Uh, it should show the partial balance. That's weird. Or did I? Did I know? Did I use it? Have, yeah, you may have. I think you. I think you did it all. But maybe if you hadn't, it would still be. Uh, what would it be? Yeah, let's change that. So, yeah, here I did use the whole fifteen hundred up, but I thought there was still. Oh no! You know what? There's not going to be a balance here until I've invoiced them for something and not zeroed out that whole invoice, right? So right. there is a negative, I see where you're going. There is mm -hmm. a negative $1,000 balance due to this customer, but you're not going to see it here. That's a good point right. because it's not a tied to AR. It's, it's tied to the liability, right? right? So we would see it on the balance sheet. Though. You would see it on the balance sheet. And again, that's where you rely on this report that we've created here. Right. Yeah. Right, because the unfiltered report shows actually all the activity for both you and the prepaid customer, and that's where you can see that they do have a balance, a liability. And it's not a balance from the customer. It's what we as right. a company owe the customer because we haven't earned it yet. Got it. Yep. So if you're doing this, now that you bring it up, it might not be a terrible idea to put a note in here, you know, as a reminder, mm -hmm. like, please check customer deposits report. Yep. Right? I like using these notes. I wish it was a little more dynamic, like where you can do even some light formatting and stuff, but it's yeah. really slick to have notes. I always use this with clients where there's detailed sort of billing instructions. I have them put the billing instructions right here oh, off of whatever idea. contract they have. Yeah, that's a good idea. But Maybe yes, that's that an excellent point. Everybody's so quiet. They're processing. That was a lot of information. So we're all processing. Did I go too fast? Yeah. All right. Sometimes I go too fast. Well, then if there's no questions, we can wrap up early and I can get this recording posted. But I'm happy to hang around and ask or answer. Mm -hmm. But that's it. That's the whole process. Use an item, customer deposits, invoice for the deposit, get the payment, then use a negative amount on that same Deposit item, all of it's linked to the liability. Uh, Seth? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a question in regards to law firms. Um, yeah. Using a negative amount on an invoice like that, uh, law firms need to keep the IOLTA trust account even with a IOLTA liability account. Mm -hmm. And I haven't found a good way to, to do that. So in this report, let me share my screen again. Here's what happens with the trust account. In this report, well, first let's go back to the balance sheet actually. So if we're dealing with a trust account, first we'll have a separate bank account where those funds get deposited into, right? And what'll happen is that trust account's balance, instead of calling it customer deposits in the liability section, we'll have a client trust liability account, right? Actually, we have time. Let me just illustrate it very specifically. So let's go first to the chart of accounts. And we'll create a new bank account. We'll call it rents held in trust. You get the idea. So client, trust, bank, save and close. Other current liabilities. Rents and trust liability, and we'll call it client trust liability. Okay. Now let's say Courtney's our client, right? And we're representing Courtney, and she gives us the uh, the uh, um, what do you call it? The the deposit, right? So what I'll also do now is, and I know this gets a little clunky, but I don't know of a better way to do this. But let's just, and again, I'm just using rents and trust because that's what they have there. But what I'll do is I'll call it Courtney H sub account of the client trust liability, save and close. Okay, so now I've got the account structure set up that I need. Let's go over to my item list, products and services list, new service, Client trust. I'm gonna think about this for a minute. Okay. 
trying to think how I have a, a law firm that I do this for. I, I don't usually do invoices for him. That's why I'm getting tripped up here. Um, so let's skip the item part because here's where that does get a little different. We're not gonna use an item because we're not gonna do an invoice. So Courtney gives me, let's say $2,000, right? Here's what I have to do. Record a bank deposit. Okay, it's going to go into the client trust bank account. Okay, and then let's go with June 19th. And this is gonna go as the offset to the Courtney H liability account for $2,000. Save and close. Back to the balance sheet. Okay, I have $2,000 in the client trust. This balance always has to match the client trust liability total and each individual client's number has to be sort of reconcilable, right? So in this case, there's just the one client, Courtney, we have her $2,000. That adds up, of course, to the total client trust liability, which then matches the client trust bank account. So that's how we deal with that sort of three-way reconciliation because we can, then I can go into the client trust liability and I can get it by client because, of, because I actually build the clients into the account structure. I could use an invoice and then total, I could have a single client trust liability account and group that by customer because I've used an invoice to get it associated with the customer, but that's not as clean as this is, especially when you're talking about IELTA accounting, right? So the complaint I get about this is the chart of accounts gets long. And I just kind of say, so be it. When the case is closed, you can make this account inactive, right? So it'll always be there if you need to refer back to the history, but it's out of the way and doesn't clutter up your chart of accounts, you know, when the clients are old. And the PI attorney that I work with, for whatever reason, seems to have a lot of recurring clients. I don't know, I guess these people are accident prone, but so sometimes we do actually resurrect those old client trust liability accounts for the customer and, and sort of just reuse that on separate cases, there's usually enough of a difference in timing so that it's very clear which case we're dealing with, um, you know, on those kinds of things. But that's how I do it. So I don't actually use an invoice in the IOLTA accounting. I just record the deposit. I set up the appropriate sub ledgers for each client's liability account. And I always make sure that the total of all the liabilities is exactly equal to the total in the client trust bank account. But then when you go, then when you need to actually apply that to an invoice. Right. So let's say we, so let's say we have some attorney's fees. Okay. So here's how that works. And it's basically, it's, you have to do two, you have to book two different things, right? So I'm going to invoice Courtney for the actual legal services. And let's just book this as of July 1. All right. And we'll add legal services. We'll set that up as an income account. Non-taxable. Okay, and we'll invoice her for $500. Save and close, okay. Nothing's happened here. We've just invoiced her, but now what we want to do is we want to take 500 out of the 2000 and apply it to that invoice, right? So what I would actually do here, so there's two things that have to be done. First, money that needs to be moved out of the client trust account and put into the checking, okay? And at the same time, we need to make sure that the same amount of money gets moved out of the, the sub ledger for Courtney's retainer, right? So the way that we can, so usually what I do in order to deal with this properly, it's tempting to wanna to just go in and record a transfer of $500 from here to here, but you can't do that because you're usurping the P&L in the, in the form of needing to apply that amount to the invoice that we've just created, right? And you're also not gonna be able to deal properly with this piece here, the liability, right? So you can't do it that way. So what we do in one instance, is I'll go to the customer and I'll say, let's receive a payment. We're gonna receive a payment on that invoice. So we're almost pretending like Courtney actually just wrote us a check, right? 
and it's going to go into the main checking. Okay, July 1 is fine for this. Save and close. In the physical world, we'll actually move the money from the trust account to the checking account, right? What we'll do in QuickBooks is I'll actually record a check and you might physically just do it with a check, you know, however you need to do that. So we're recording a check out of the trust account. And again, we're just booking that directly against the liability, $500. And in the description, I'll make sure I'll put attorney fees for Courtney versus Greg. I'm picking on Greg since he left, right? And of course we can put Courtney's name in here just as a way of getting this associated with that customer. So now when I hit save and close, my trust account, bank account represents, has the, the same, the $1,500 in it. Courtney's sub ledger now shows the same $1,500 because I dealt with that piece with that last check that I just wrote. And I received the payment on the invoice and deposited it into the checking account. Did I actually deposit it or did I leave it in undeposited funds? I did actually deposit it. So we have the deposit going into the checking account. In the real world, we'll move the money, 500 from the trust account into the checking account. And then everything balances perfectly. So it's a few extra steps when you're dealing with the IELTA accounting, but I don't see how to get around that. You know, it's not as efficient as when we're just dealing with, you know, regular customer deposits. And this comes up in the real estate world all the time as well, because a lot of brokers in a lot of states will receive earnest money from their client that they hold on to, and then that gets applied to the commissions that they've earned when title closes. Yeah, so, what happens if the client wanted to see that reduction on their invoice, you know? Um, that gets a little tricky, but we could show them now an invoice that shows the fact that a payment is reflected, right? The other thing you could do for the client is you could drill into their specific subsidiary ledger and show the history. You could show, we, well, we got 2000 from you on the 19th and we used 500 of it on July 1st. Yeah, I, I suppose it comes into play when, you know, what you're invoicing is greater than the retention amount and they want to apply, you know, it's the last invoice to say you're billing $5,000. You want to apply the, the remaining $1,500 to retainer and show a balance of 3,500. Right, so what I've done in those cases, if I, I'll run this history to kind of show them how we got to that history and I'll, I can, you can dump it into Excel and then attach it to the invoice and email that to them. I see. That's how I would normally deal with that. So you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't deal with items um, in this situation because you're crossing. Yeah, because you have to deal with the flow between the client trust liability and the trust bank account versus the money that went into the actual operating account. Right. Yeah. Right. So you have an added layer of complexity there because of the way it has to be tracked. You know, you could zero this out and that would, I mean, you could do it. You could get it done to where you would use a negative item. But what I'm, what I, what you would also wind up having to do if you're using an item is we would literally need a separate item for each client that's linked to their client trust liability account. So well, how would you, how would, like if you were just doing like for this one specific one, how would you do that? So let's go back to the original invoice. So instead of receiving the payment on this invoice, what I could have done was I would have to create a, a product and I would call it let's just call it CTL for short for client trust liability dash Courtney. And then this has to be linked to Courtney's specific liability sub account, right? This would be the minus 500. So now you could see, all right, we're billing for legal services, but we're taking it out of her trust funds, right? Courtney is a trust fund baby. <laughs> she wishes. But I, don't, but I don't think that works because it takes it out of liability, but it doesn't take it out of the... Well, I was uh, just going to say, so again, we still need two separate transactions because this will reduce the liability 
right? But then we also have to record the transfer from the liability bank account to the to the operating checking account. Oh, right. And that's how you effectively get paid. So this takes care of the liability and then separately you do a transfer between the two bank accounts. And then once again, everything balances. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, so rather than the two-step process you started with at the very first and did the, um, the, the check in the IOLTA account affecting the cash and then the, the receipt payment, you would do this and then you would then do a transfer between the two bank accounts. Exactly. Okay. So, so this is actually a little cleaner probably, but it makes for a long item list you know, which you also have represented in the liability section under the client trust liability. Again, there's, it doesn't really matter. And then as, as I said before, you can make stuff inactive when you no longer need it, you know, once Courtney's case is over. Right, yeah. The other okay. thing to consider though, is because we're gonna be using a lot of elements on the list, being the chart of accounts and the products and services list, you're going to run into that limitation that now exists in QBO where once you have more than 250 accounts in the chart of accounts, they're gonna force you to upgrade to QuickBooks Online Advanced. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there's that. I forget what the limit is on the products and services list. I know classes, it's like 40. I don't yeah. know if there's a limit on products and services actually. I forgot. So I've just, I've just kept all my, I've just kept it as one client liability trust and- And you group um, it by customer, yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep, that's the way around that. Because as I showed earlier, it would work the same way in the client trust liability where you have the single account, you group it by customer, and then you don't have to worry about all the extra accounts. So that's the other way. But I've been, I've been I don't want to say criticized, but I've had people suggest to me that they don't like having them all lumped into one single liability account because they're worried it could get messy. But again, it's just that's just a matter of probably having a regular habit of going into that account and looking at it group by customer to make sure that everything's clean, you know. It's just bookkeepers will make a mess of this if they're not experienced and don't know what they're doing. I've seen that a lot where then you have to clean things up, like they take things out of the wrong, but that could happen either way. That could happen with either structure actually. Yeah, I see, okay. So that's, it's just something that has to be managed very closely. Are you an attorney, Randy, or are you a, an accountant who serves attorneys? Yeah, I'm an accountant that serves attorneys. Right. Yeah, so at the end of the day is, you know, you just have to manage it very closely, which often translates to or should translates to charge accordingly, you know, because there is an extra amount of attention that needs to be paid to this to make sure that it stays in sync in terms of the client trust liability in the bank account. Yeah, yeah, very well said, yes. <laughs> yep. It's, a, it's double the work. Yeah. Great, Randy, I'm glad you were here. That got, that got us into something really important, I think. Here I am, <laughs> I was <are>. hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are. Um, anybody else, any questions? All right, so I will, uh, I'll get this recording posted up. And what I may actually do is, I was gonna do the lesson in the course in two separate lessons, one to show capturing the deposit and one to show how to use it up. I think I'm gonna consolidate that into one lesson on customer deposits and I'll probably just use this video, might as well. It's covered it pretty well, especially with Randy's questions because now we got the IOLTA piece and the more general, like I'm just collecting deposits from customers version. Yeah, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you, anybody else? Any questions? We have time. My timer says I still have eight minutes. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I will get this wrapped up and posted and you know where to find me if you need anything. And we do have a form in the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course for those who are in it where you can actually suggest topics for these webinars. So let me know if you need to know where that form is and I'll get it to you. And that will be a wrap. I will see you all tomorrow morning. No, we're not gonna see you tomorrow morning. I'm taking off from tomorrow through next week. Next Friday, we're doing the Friday Zoom. And for those of you who wanna learn how to do a little video editing, I'm gonna show you some of my top tips and tricks for editing videos, which is a great way, by the way, to make videos about accounting and attract more clients. So there's that. You can make your own video about how to do customer deposits now. <laughs> and on that note, I'm gonna go. I will see you all on the flip side.
Great. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good one.